Well, welcome everybody and welcome to our State of the Schools for Dublin City Schools. We're really, really happy you're all here. So thanks for taking time out of your busy days um, and for the patience that it took to find parking spots. So thank you. <laughs> My name is Lynn May and I currently serve as the president of your school board. Um, thank you all for being here once again. We're here tonight to honor our past and to discuss our future. Throughout the evening, we will be introducing some honored guests, but the first person I'd like to introduce is Senator Jim Hughes, who's going to lead us in the pledge. Mr. Hughes, all rise. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. We appreciate that. That's how we start all our school board meetings. Um, we also have here this evening State Representative Mike Duffy. I'm not sure if any of the other state representatives are here, but thank you for being here. Um, with Dublin City Schools Board of Education, we have Vice President Stu Harris, um, Scott Melody, Chris Valentine, I'm Rick Weininger. We also have former school board member, Mark Holderman. And with city council, we have Vice Mayor Rick Gerber, Tim Lechleiter, Amy Sale, and Greg Peterson. We're also honored to have city manager, Dana McDaniel. Washington Township trustee, Jean Bostick and Denise Franz King. I think Hein our Dublin Police Chief Heinz von Eckertsburg might be here. We're also very honored to have business advisory council members Michael Blackwell from the Columbus Public Library in Dublin. Dr. William Burke, Ash Michaela, Deborah Johnson, Amber Hume, Eric Norman, and Rich Weber. And Rich is also uh, a former Dublin High School grad, and has, he supported our school for decades, along with his father, Chai. Um, I spoke about honoring our past, and I've lived in this school district for 24 years. During that time, we've added two high schools, two middle schools, and three elementary schools. And many of us who have been here for a long time can remember what that felt like. 24 years ago, when I moved here, our enrollment was a little more than 8,000. 34 years ago, our enrollment was about 2,600. Well, today, we have more than 15,200 students enrolled. In less than a generation, we have seen our district transform from a small farming community into Ohio's 11th largest district and one of its best. This transformation did not happen by accident. It took hard work, perseverance, the ability to adapt to change, and there's been quite a bit of it, and most importantly, an unwavering commitment to providing our children with the best possible education our resources will provide. And thank you for that, you all. I have served, off, I've served on the board for the past 10 years, and during that time, our lives have been changed by technology. Our kids' lives have been changed by technology. Today's high school students have never known life without the internet. Now think about that when you were in high school. Life without Facebook and Twitter is an unknown for them. Today's kindergarten students can only wonder what types of technology lie ahead. In the past 10 years, we have seen the state's education standards and rating systems undergo change after change after change, and our staff has been very accommodating and has pushed on. We thank them for that. We have seen the state funding slowly erode, and as it has, our community has stepped up to, to support its school system. And Mr. Osborne will speak a little bit more about that later. But because of that commitment that our community makes to the education of our kids, during the past 10 years, we have seen Dublin schools transform into the highest performing large district in Ohio, and that does not come easy. Everyone works really hard to get that done. We have seen our Dublin teachers continue to step into leadership roles, continue to embrace change and accountability, and most of all, continue their dedication to our children. 
Thanks in large part to the expertise of our teaching staff, our students attend some of the finest university and colleges in the United States. So thank you to this community for supporting and helping build Dublin City Schools. And on that note, it is my pleasure to introduce to you our treasurer for the past seven years, Mr. Steve Osborne. All right, good evening. It is so good to see all of you here tonight as we get the opportunity, which we don't get a lot of opportunities to do so, to celebrate some of the successes that we've had in our district over the last year or two, and also look at some of the challenges that we're going to be facing over the next, next one, two, three, or four years. I want to start off tonight, as Mrs. May also did, just introducing some of the uh, honored guests that we have here tonight, starting with representatives from our Dublin Education Foundation, and I'm going to throw out a really short advertisement for them actually. Those folks do a great job of raising funds for the teachers in our classroom, teachers and staff, for innovative and new and pilot programs that we do outside of the regular curriculum. And they spend a lot of time and bring in money to do that. And I want to introduce David Anderson is here tonight, the group treasurer, uh, Stacy Holderman and Kaylee Michelow, uh, both teachers in our district, uh, Mabel Wu and Marcia Temple. Also want to recognize several of our Hall of Fame members who are here tonight, uh, including Larry Falk, Urban Le Leona Jones, Leonard Tracy, Chai Weber, and Kip Witchy. Very pleased tonight to have several members also of our Senior Council, and these folks come together four to five times a year to learn what we're doing in our schools and be ambassadors for our schools, going out and letting the community know as well. And here tonight uh, representing Senior Counseling uh, is Bruce Bayer, Amy Bowman, Ann Bowman, I'm sorry, Joyce Borlinger, Keith and Elaine Ebert, Jane Frontone, Peg Cock, Mary Knoll, Florence Rings, and Diane Lowry. And also very pleased tonight to have representatives from our Dublin Chamber of Commerce who do so much for our community, especially with the, uh, the com commercial and industrial section, and Bob Darrow, and Jenny Jaxie is here tonight, too, so we appreciate that. And finally, for introductions, I'm going to uh, want to take a moment to recognize our DSA, Dublin Support Association President, uh, Howard French, who is here tonight. And certainly, uh, the partnership we have with them uh, is fantastic, and they do so much for our district. It's, we hear stories about teachers every day, but we also hear the stories about our cooks and our secretaries and our maintenance and custodial and clinic aides and all those folks and transportation drivers who do so much for our kids. So. Tonight, I'm very pleased and, and proud to be here to talk and give a little update on the financial situation for our district right now, which some years are better than others. School finance changes every time the wind blows, and it's, it's interesting to see where we've been and where we're heading uh, with that. I want to start tonight talking about where we have focused over the last couple of years. And the first area to talk about is a good area. Uh, when the last operating levy was passed in the district, and that was in November of 2012, our Board of Education, our administrators, we committed that uh, that levy would last three years. Uh, and very proud tonight that we have been able to stretch that for four years. There will not be another levy request in 2015. Uh, that will be put off until 2016. And we have spent a lot of time and a lot of effort doing that. Uh, through several different ways, and I'm going to talk. First of all, it helps when a state budget is proposed, as it was two years ago, where there were no reductions in funding. Unfortunately, I'll talk a little bit about that tonight for the new one that uh, has just been proposed last week, and there are some reductions in funding proposed in that for us. But two years ago, there weren't, and that helped us significantly. Um, also, just minor changes that we've made to the district. Uh, bringing on this last year, explain my benefits, where we have taken paper, we are taking paper out of, out of the buildings as far as administrative. Um, connecting electronically to all of our insurance carriers, everything's immediate, everything's on time and takes away a lot of uh, personnel time and a lot of supply expense. Board docs, if you haven't had the opportunity to look at the new tool we're using for board meetings, go to our district website and look at how electronically our board agendas are out there now so you not only see the board agenda but you see all the attachments and everything that goes along with that. Uh, so that has helped save, again, paperwork, save uh, staff time, just paperless processes that we're working on, copiers and printers, taking that down, 
the purchasing consortiums uh, that we belong to, to group purchase supplies, materials, utilities, uh, purchasing aggregate utilities with other districts, other large employers where we're able to see reductions there. Uh, and again, our staffing review. And you'll hear Dr. Hoadley speak about that tonight. But staffing is 85% of our budget. That is where, when we can make changes, when somebody leaves the district, it's not an automatic replace. It's a review. We're going to look and see what our certifications are, what needs do we have with the growing enrollment that we have, and make sure that we're being as smart and efficient as possible in how we're spending the taxpayer dollars that we're entrusted with. And finally, transparency making all this information available. One of the things we hear a lot of times during levies is that, man, I wish this stuff was available not just at levy time, and it's not. I mean, we are really making an effort, we have continued to make the effort, because it's been done for many years, of getting financial information out to the, our constituents, to our residents, to the people who are paying the bills uh, for our taxpayer dollars. And we get that information out. If you go to our district website and under finance, what you're going to find is you're going to find the monthly financial statements. You're going to find the district five-year forecast with the notes. You're going to find the comprehensive annual financial reports all the way back to 2001, fiscal year 2001. Those are there for your review. We also include out there just handouts that we do on financial updates, uh, as well as information uh, on insurance and a lot of other things that you can use to evaluate and to review and see how your tax dollars are being spent. Um, a great way to look. So we have really spent a lot of time the last couple of years focusing on these areas. I want to just move on, of course, where are we financially? And wanted to just look very briefly at the, financial, the cash balances at the end of our fiscal years. We are currently in fiscal year um, 15, and right now, we're anticipating a balance of 48.53 million at the end of the year, and these dollars sound big. They do, but keeping in mind, the Government Finance Officers Association recommends that we maintain a three-month balance, which is going to be close to 45 to 50 million dollars at the end of every fiscal year. I'll be honest; there are not many school districts in Ohio that can do that. Uh, it's difficult to ask your taxpayers for money if you have that kind of a balance. But when you're looking at our bu uh, budget right now and our anticipated ending balance through fiscal year 17, which is actually the next levy cycle when it would be collected, we're over uh, a 30-day balance. And again, you never know what's going to pop up. We are trying to be as fiscally conservative as we can, but not being unrealistic in, in what our cash balances are or for what we would ask for. So our balances are positive right now through fiscal year 18, of course, well under the 30-day balance in fiscal year 18, and then looking out to a negative in fiscal year 19. Looking at the activity in our district, we are a $184 million operation. And it's hard to believe that sometimes. I know when I was in school, I never thought of schools at all being in that business factor with those kind of funds coming through. We have seen 184 million anticipating for revenue this year. Total revenue for our district is just over 270 million, over a quarter of a billion dollars that we have coming into all funds, not just the general operating funds. 184 of which 80%, close to 80% is real estate is our taxpayers, is our local taxpayers. And again, this goes back to the school funding formula. This goes back to the ability of our taxpayers to contribute and for the type of education that we want to provide in this community. But 80% is real estate uh, and local taxes. 19% state funding. 19%, and I want to break that down for you. 19%, really 9% is through the state funding formula. The other 10% is the rollback and homestead credit that uh, the state reimburses us for that you don't pay as part of your real estate taxes. So 19% uh, total, and then we have about 1% that is miscellaneous, and that will be building rentals and uh, pay to participate fees and things like that. When you're looking at that real estate portion, though, I want to highlight how it's changed in Dublin over the last few years. Back in 1989, it was about a 50-50 split. 50% 50 of our real estate uh, revenues were coming from commercial industrial, 50% from residential. That is shifting, and that has shifted. 1996, we were at 40% commercial industrial and 60% residential, and today, 72% residential. Not hard to figure out, actually, as we look so fortunate, and we have so many members of our Dublin City Council here tonight who have done so much to make our commercial industrial tax base and the companies that are here very strong and, and supportive. 
But all those fields out there that have filled with houses, that is where we've seen that residential piece, piece grow. And that will continue, per our estimates, as we go into the future. But that is where that is coming from right now. Expenditures, I mentioned we were $184 million anticipating coming in this year, looking at $181 million going out. And again, this is an area that we are a service organization in Dublin. This is different when I talk about manufacturing and corporate and cost of goods sold. We are service. We are providing service to our kids. And over 80, 85 percent, over 85 percent is salaries and benefits. That is where it is. So that is why when the common question of when you're going to make reductions if a levy doesn't get approved or cuts have to be made, that is where you're going to see those reductions because that is the majority of our budget. Anything that's in sal or in uh, purchase services or capital or outlay or uh, supplies, very little can be reduced there. I mean, we can't cut a lot with the natural gas or the bus fuel or that other than if, you, if you're cutting transportation. But a lot of fixed costs that go into that. So. This is the area where we um, see a lot, of, um, a lot of flexibility, or not flexibility, but a lot of opportunities to make changes within that. Where and what are we looking at over the next few years? I've given you an update of where we sit today. Certainly state funding, and Dr. Holy mentioned, or I'm sorry, Mrs. May mentioned this earlier tonight. State funding is a big piece. Governor Kasich introduced his budget last week, and as we've been reviewing that, and it takes a while to go through that, uh, we are looking at a decrease this coming uh, next two-year period of about $4.2 million. And that doesn't sound huge compared to a $184 million budget, but that's $4.2 million we'll lose over the next two years, and then we'll be gone forever after that. Uh, the actual state funding formula uh, that is in place right now actually shows us getting a 10% increase next year and the year after, which equates to about $1.8 million in the first year and about $2 million in the second year. Small amounts, but that's a step in the right direction. We are capped, however, um, so that with the funding formula as it stands, we would get more, but uh, has been capped because of budgetary concerns within the state at 10%. Uh, so always looking to get more there because we are not a district. When we have more students moving in, that's not affecting our student, student count. Um, so we consider that. Um, also looking at um, the tangible personal property tax, and that is the big factor here. Keep in mind, in 2004, we were bringing in about a little over $10 million in tangible personal property tax from our local businesses. That structure changed, and today, uh, before this new budget goes into place, we're bringing in about $4.2 million a year, and that's reimbursement from the state because that tangible personal property tax has been phased out. We're bringing in about uh, $4.2 million in the new budget that will drop to 860000 for next year and zero the year after. So that will be gone. And I think what concerns us most is in 2004 when the tracks changed for that, the understanding at the time, and there, everybody was in support of this at the time, it was a way to eliminate some business taxes and was replaced by the CAT tax, which is now in place. But at the time, this tangible reimbursement was supposed to be phased out, but the school districts were supposed to receive additional state funding to make up for that. Interesting when we talk about that then, because when you compare 2004 state funding this year, the current 2015, we're just getting back to where we were in 2004. We will be at about $15 million this year. That's where we were in 2004, and it's gone down ever since, starting to come back up. So not only then are we losing the $10 million we had in tangible personal property tax, but we have seen no increase in state funding over the last 10 plus years. Uh, and that is, a, is a, a challenge for us and is a problem. And we're going to be working with our legislature as we work through this problem because that's a major drop. So that is going to be one of our challenges. This is something that will be hitting really in March as the legislature starts to come together and review that budget. There's going to be numerous changes before we get to the end of the road, which will be uh, with the House in, in April and then the Senate should pick it up, probably history telling us in, in May, so that a new budget is in place by July 1. So this will be our focus over the next several months as we look to try to even this out a little bit. I want to talk a little bit about the additions at the elementary school. Elementary 13, uh, of course, has been repurposed for additional classrooms. Well, great news from an operating standpoint because this is, uh, we are saving operating costs. Over 1.9, almost $2 million a year that we'll be saving uh, by adding these classrooms versus having a new elementary building with all administrative staff, custodial, all those folks. This is a way to utilize the buildings we currently have and help maintain enrollment at least through 2020, and I'm sure you'll hear more about that tonight 
as we go through. But that will be and has been, we will, uh, a priority. We did not sell the bonds for that building in 2008 when it was approved by the, uh, the community. That 14.5 million, we've held the authority since that point and we'll actually be meeting with the bond rating agencies in uh, uh, the end of March so that we can go ahead and finance that then. So you've not been paying for that. Uh, that uh, will be added as we go along then and we're trying to structure that right now so it won't affect the bond millage trying to stretch it over a number of years because we will see our bond millage in this district start to de decline in 2018 uh, as some of the building processes from uh, 1994 and beyond are starting to be fully paid just like a mortgage. So we will be looking at that. And again, stretching the levy cycle. That is a focus for us, not only trying to be as efficient as we can be using Six Sigma concepts, looking at ways, being smart like businesses, processing as best we can knowing that the difference between a business is you're dealing with manufacturing products or, or something like that. Our business is dealing with kids and dealing with opportunities for kids. And it's very difficult sometimes to make cuts because you're, you're, what might be one child's strength is another child's weakness. And you want to be able to cover uh, and make, be as, uh, give as many opportunities as you can to the kids. So stretching the light levy cycle continues to be our goal and also helps us to reduce how much we ask for in future levies. That is our goal as well, uh, because the, the more responsible we can be, the easier it can be later on. So certainly encourage you, I'm going to close it right there, but I encourage you to go ahead and contact our office if you ever have any questions. I'm very fortunate tonight, Jeremy Buskirk and Julie Stromberg, our assistant treasurer and accountant are here. We love emails, we love questions coming in because we like to get the truth out there and get the facts out there so everybody has a good understanding of what's going on. But please, Email us, call us at any time, and look there. We uh, try to make sure all the information is as updated as it can be uh, and that we get it out to you. So that's a brief snapshot of where we are right now. I'm very pleased right now to turn the podium over uh, to talk to Dr. Todd Hoodley, our superintendent, who's now in his second year in the district. Thank you. Thank you. I need to start off by just saying, wow, look at all the people in here, and doesn't this speak so well of the passion that people have and the dedication that we have across our, our Dublin communities for Dublin City Schools. I want to thank you for coming tonight. There are a lot of things that you could be doing on this evening, and to come out here and to listen to our State of the Schools really is very meaningful, and I want to, again, say thank you for coming out here this evening. Wonderful. I also want to make, uh, and, and there have been a lot of special guests, and, and while this one is unplanned, I want to um, introduce Flo Rings, who is 98 years old and has lived the last 95 years in Dublin, and she's a special guest here tonight of Dublin City Schools. Thank you for coming, Flo. It is my pleasure tonight to share with you uh, some wonderful stories about what is going on here in our school district, Dublin City Schools. And honoring the past and also looking to the future is our theme tonight. And our secondary theme that you're going to hear out uh, this evening is the Dublin difference. And those things that really, those, those common threads that make our school district the wonderful place that it is for children. Being in public education, and it is a true honor to be a public educator, I often look, and I think most uh, persons that are in leadership roles in an organization will ask the question, what is our fundamental role and purpose? What are we all about? What is the role of Dublin City Schools within the community of Dublin? Moreover, what is the role of public education <clears throat> in this great democracy of the United States. And I want you to just pause and think a little bit about that because public education has a long history, really dating back to Thomas Jefferson in the early 1800s and, and coming through uh, his vision of what this country needed in its infancy to make sure that it prospered as, as a nation. And so just for a moment, I'd ask you to pause and think, what's the fundamental role What's the fundamental purpose of Dublin City Schools and moreover of public education? Now for me that is an easy, easy answer and I'm going to invite uh, 
uh, our students up here. I'm gonna ask you guys to come up here now because this is the answer. So students, come on up here. Let me, let me ask you to form a line right up here. These students are members of a superintendent's advisory committee that we have. And I wanna take a moment to just introduce them and ask them to step forward as I do here. Um, Hallie Bentley, Maddie Arena, Janelle Gans, Evan Huttress, Jackson Candlewall, Drew Kruger, Beth Lusgarden, Sean Menon, Addison Stern, and Olivia Stuckey. I really want to thank these students for being here tonight, and I, I want to use them. And, and they didn't know walking in here tonight that they were going to be part of my uh, discussion, so I want to thank them for this. They didn't realize uh, uh, this, but you've all done a nice job uh, uh, walking in here and, and finding your seats and, and surprised about being in the front row of, of this great audience tonight. When we look at our students, and, and this, these students do a wonderful job of representing Dublin City Schools, and when we ask again and fall back on that role and purpose, I could come up here tonight and share with you the wonderful academic success. And it's an easy story to tell in Dublin when we talk about an ACT average composite score of 25.4 for our students. Now keep in mind the national average is 21. The average in the state of Ohio is 22. And the composite average in Dublin is 25.4. That is, that is a wonderful testimony to the efforts of our students, but moreover, the efforts of our teachers and parents and everybody working together to get that level of academic success. And there was a time that a lot of schools would utilize test scores as a way to justify the great program that they had in place. And that's certainly one lens, looking at test scores. But our students are a testament far beyond test scores, and, and our educational program here is far beyond just looking through one single lens of academic success. While that is an important lens, it's not simply the only lens that we look for. And so when we look, how else can we look at Dublin and the success of our students? We could easily go to the athletic arena. If you've lived in Dublin for a while, you know the high success of our athletic programs at all three high schools, at all four middle schools. Maddie, you've been on the state championship golf team, I think four years in a row at Jerome. Unparalleled, four straight Division I girls championship golf team. Congratulations to Maddie on that. I look at Addison, a member of our rugby, or rugby lacrosse team over at Jerome, who's played in multiple state championships. Looking forward to one more this spring, I am sure. Drew going to college to play soccer at Davidson, I believe. It speaks again to that athletic success. And so when we're looking at well-rounded students, we have high academics, we have outstanding athletics, and we believe in athletics in this community because, not because of the wins and losses. And while I highlighted state championships, it's more important those benefits that you get about being a part of a team, working together to, uh, to achieve those are intrinsic things that we believe make up a huge part of a world-class, well-rounded education. So we have the academics, we have the athletics, and if you had any time tonight, and I certainly hope that you did, to hear our strings program, and I wanna share with you, those were middle school students. Middle school students from Carr, under the direction of our fabulous teacher, Matt Holly. The fine arts in this district are second to none, whether it be the visual arts, drama, music programs, and strings. We have just a fabulous situation for our students who want to achieve and excel in the area of music. So when you look at our success as a school district athletically, academically, and in the arts, we truly are a AAA school district, and, and I'm very proud of that. And that is, again, a testimony to the wonderful students that we have here in Dublin City Schools. But that's not the real key, and that's not the Dublin difference. Some schools have great academics, some schools have great athletics, some have great arts, we're fortunate, I think we have all three. 
but the double indifference is more about the internal of what we try to develop with the children of the school district. A long time ago, a very wise person by the name of Aristotle said, education of the head without educating the heart is not an education at all. And I want to say that again, educating the head without educating the heart is not an education at all. And so I want to tell you a brief story about the superintendent advisory group. These students, we meet every four to six weeks. Some of you have been on, I think, your whole high school career. And what these students do, besides give me some pretty candid feedback sometimes about uh, maybe snow days or parking lots or things of that nature that's important in the world of a teenager, um, they, on their own, and this was really, I think, a vision of Dr. Axner, my predecessor, organize a community dodgeball event. It takes place, I think, March 27th is at the date this year at Scioto High School. And to date, since it began uh, just a few years ago, has raised over $80,000. $80,000 all by the work of these students. And again, these students represent all of our students here in Dublin. They have donated this money to the Special Olympics, to the Lindsay and Kyle Foundation, to Welcome Warehouse, to a plethora of different, uh, very deserving uh, charities because intrinsically inside our students, they understand that part of being a Dublin student is that need to give back. Part of being a Dublin student is the need to help those who have less or have a time of need in their life. And so the efforts of these students and the efforts of students across the board, we just came out of our holiday season, the number of food drives, the number of code drives, the efforts that our students on a daily basis do to give back is truly outstanding. I hope you had a chance to look and see the peer collaboration booth. Uh, that was the Kaufman group uh, that was in there. Wonderful work by our students because again, that heart is a huge component of an important educational component there, and that is truly the Dublin difference. I wanna thank these students for being here tonight. Moreover, I wanna thank you for what you do as leaders in each of your high schools. For your seniors, I wanna wish you a uh, good finish to your school year, safe finish, and keep the nose to the grindstone, I know you will. And as they transition back to their seats, I'd ask uh, in the control booth to play the first video that gives a little bit more of an understanding for all of you about the wonderful work done by our students here in Dublin City Schools. Thank you. My name is Drew Kruger and I'm a senior at Dublin Kaufman High School. I've had the privilege over the last couple of years of being a part of the Superintendent's Student Advisory Committee and as a part of that committee, one of the biggest things we do every year is we organize the district-wide charity dodgeball tournament. We come up with a, a list of beneficiaries and we try and find a, a cause that's prominent in the district at the time. It's a great event. Uh, we've helped raise over $82,000 over the last several years and we're hoping to raise even more this year. The community in the district is incredible and seeing the students give back uh, every day we have uh, fundraisers and events going on at every school all the time throughout the year. We have events for students who are, who are struggling. I uh, coughed this year. Riley Steiner uh, was diagnosed with cancer earlier this fall and we were able to uh, come together as a school and rally behind her and come up with some different promotional things and events to kind of help her and uh, give her hope and strength. There's Kinder Key Caroling, there's uh, collections for food pantries and it's, it's just a great community with a lot of students trying to get together, rally behind causes in the district, and give back as much as we can. It's this charitable spirit that makes up the Dublin difference. I'd say I've seen that video probably two dozen times and it gets, gets me right now. These students, and again, that, that Dublin difference of, of trying to build within character to our students, that's what we're really searching for, and that I know is what long has allowed this community and, and, and this school system to thrive in some challenging times. Now we know that these students, and, and we know that in education, in order to be successful, it is a partnership, a partnership between the home and the school. And, and so much of what these students bring is established by their parents 
and, and their loved ones in the home. And it is a truly a partnership. So we make every effort we can to work directly with the home and make sure that our moms and dads are very involved in their children's education and finding ways to allow that involvement and also very informed. There's a tremendous number of things that are going on in our school each and every day. And so working with parents, working with moms and dads, grandmas and grandpas, and all the loved ones of our children, working hand in hand in partnership really allows us to take education here in Dublin to the next level. We have wonderful support, and I'm going to highlight a couple of the people here tonight. A couple groups that we have. Uh, one, we have fabulous PTO organizations across all of our schools. And we have several of our presidents that are here tonight. I'd like to introduce Kristen Alcox, Sue Berg, Lindsay Gillis, Sue Huttress, Dawn McDowell, Karen McCafferty, Meredith Seeger, and Carrie Perman. Their leadership among our PTOs as well as the leaders of the other really allows our PTOs to be that pathway for parents to engage with the school district here. I think that group we're going to meet uh, this Thursday, uh, again at the Tech House, and they give us wonderful ideas and sometimes candid feedback about how we can continuously improve Dublin City Schools. Another group that we have that is just as beneficial, and this is a large district, so there's always questions that are being asked throughout the community, and sometimes in the central office, I'll be the last to know what's really being out there. So we have established a group this year called the Key Communicators. And we have about 30 persons spread across the district. And again, we meet on a monthly basis. And I wanna introduce a few of them that are here tonight. I've seen Stacy Fuller, uh, Kim Hall, Noreen Mirando, Becca Mayer, Katie O'Neill, and Daniel Zupnik. And I'm sure I've missed a couple more because I, I've seen a few here tonight. That group, again, really, they're the eyes and the ears of our community and if you have some things that you need to know about please let them know or please let us know parent involvement is a key an absolute essential for any school district and so our next video shares a little bit from sales PTO president Becca Mayer who is also a key communicator on the importance of parents and more importantly the importance of communicating with our parents here in Dublin City Schools <music> My name is Becca Mayer, and I'm a parent here in Dublin City Schools. I have a freshman at Kaufman and a seventh grader at Sells, and I think it's really important for parents to be informed and involved, and there are lots of ways to get information here from Dublin City Schools. They have a fantastic website, there's a Facebook page, Twitter, Dr. Hoadley has done lunch webinars to inform people about what's going on in the community. There have been a number of podcasts that have been posted that Dr. Hoadley has done, as well as Kim Miller, our Chief Academic Officer. There are always meetings going on in the community, and Dr. Hoadley has hosted a number of coffees, and that's a great way for people to come to him with concerns about the district, and for him to uh, share things about the district as well. Research has proven that parents who are informed and involved um, lead to more successful students. A lot of times these kids are doing better in school academically, they're more socially well adjusted, and they're just more excited about going to school. So I think Dublin Schools does a great job of informing parents, helping us to guide our kids to make great choices. So I think that's just one of the things that helps to make up a part of the Dublin difference. Becca, thank you for those words. And one of the slides in there, Kim Wilson, who is the superintendent at Toll's special guest here tonight, was highlighted. Kim, thank you also for being here this evening. Again, that partnership between parents and schools is so, so valuable because when you have that strong partnership, great things can happen for children. Now, we've touched upon students and we've touched upon parents, but state of the schools, we want to cover all the bases. And, and the thing that has been really tremendously impressive to me since I arrived in Dublin. Uh, I started, this is my, I counted this up today, my 559th workday. And so it, it only seems like 1,559. Uh, but our teachers are second to none. And I say that unequivocally. It is amazing to me to see the passion and the dedication that our teachers bring 
each and every day, they are so professional, they're talented, and, and so dedicated to our students. We have over 15,000 students. Many come with uh, some challenges on occasion, whether that be uh, a disability, whether that be uh, coming from a foreign country that doesn't allow them to understand uh, English. And our teachers have tremendous patience and also work to ensure that every single one, and I mean every single one of our 15,000 plus students receive that well-rounded world-class education. I want to introduce a couple here tonight. Uh, our, our Teachers Association is led by Donna O'Connor, and I've seen Donna here tonight. We also have a teacher advisory committee that meets with me uh, about on a month or two month basis here. And Roger Raybold uh, from Scioto, Jennifer Reardon uh, from uh, Daniel Wright, and Nicole Sutherland from Kaufman High School. All three of those persons are here tonight representing the student, or I'm sorry, the teacher advisory committee to me. I want to thank them for their attendance, but moreover, I want to thank all of our teachers who are here tonight for the work that you do each and every day for our children. Our next video shows a little bit, in fact, our next two videos are gonna show some of the dedication that our teachers here. The first one is uh, another special video to me uh, showing the work of our teachers at Daniel Wright Elementary. Uh, that is an elementary uh, that has a number of students from all over the world that have moved there, a number of different languages spoken, it has a free and reduced population of about 60%, and our teachers each and every day come in and they work with those students and the results that they are able to obtain, again, working with the students, working with the parents collectively, amazing results happening at Daniel Wright. Please roll this video. My name is Kelly Traber and I am a fourth grade teacher and K through two numeracy coach at Daniel Wright Elementary. Statistics show that our teachers are definitely experts in their fields, uh, but well beyond the awards and the distinctions and even the degrees comes a level of compassion and caring that our teachers demonstrate for our students. For example, over at Wright Elementary, I witness every day small acts of kindness and very large acts. Uh, for example, our staff has collected food and clothing for students who may need them in addition to collecting um, holiday gifts. Uh, one of our most powerful examples of ways that our staff goes above and beyond is our librarian. She has collected and operated a community bike drive where the community has donated bikes and she has enlisted the support of the community along with the students at Wright to repair them and distribute to families in need. But these kindnesses are not just specific to Wright Elementary. I see and hear of my colleagues every day who go well above and beyond their job description. I hear of colleagues who attend extracurricular events and sporting events outside of school hours, in addition to keeping very close tabs and talking with families well past when a student is in their classroom. It's all of this that makes up the Dublin difference. Again, I love that video. Kelly Traber is one of our rock stars in doing wonderful work helping the teachers at Daniel Wright. And also you heard, and I'm gonna go back to that same theme, educating the head without educating the heart is not an education. And so our teachers are not only in it to, to work with our children and have them develop, uh, again, the academic success, but also working to model and to show compassion and, and to teach that and to build that into the character of our students here. Many of you may have uh, uh, witnessed uh, earlier, in fact, I think it was in early December, uh, one of our Chapman teachers, Nicole Durant, was featured on the Dr. Oz Show. Wonderful program that has been created over at Chapman and actually been replicated in a couple of our other elementary schools called Blessings in a Backpack. Thinking in Dublin and free and reduced, that's, that causes a lot of cognitive dissonance to a lot of people. Those are not words that really had ever been in the same sentence. But we have a growing number of children that come from families of poverty here. And, and again, they need our help. They need the success academically like all of our children do. And so Blessings in a Backpack is a program where on Fridays, 
not only does a teacher make sure that the child has their homework and books to take home for the weekend, but also make sure that the child has some food in the backpack because the number of children that we have that eat breakfast and lunch every day here, and that's their only meal is growing. Our free and reduced population in several of our elementary schools is north of 50%. And again, that is something that is uncharacteristic to Dublin, but is something that is wonderful to see the passion and the efforts of our educators in making sure that the children have not just nourishment for their minds, but nourishment for their stomachs uh, over, over a long weekend. So I wanna share again and highlight from a state of the school standpoint, I could not be more thrilled with the quality of teaching staff that we have here in Dublin. Now as we transition to the future, and a lot of people have asked me, and in fact in last week's uh, Dublin Villager, there was a, co or, uh, a column that we wrote about continually increasing, which is a good, again one of our core values. How do we continuously improve everything we do? How are we continuously improving technology and technology integration into the learning process for our students? And that is something that is so important. I'm gonna, I'm gonna share a, something to give you that will probably bring you pause, but our kindergarten students today, our little babies five years old going to school today, if retirement age stays at 65, they'll hit retirement age in 2080. 2080. I, I hope I'm alive in 2080. Um, I'd love to see that, and I'm hoping for one of our students to have some medical advances that will allow me to, uh, <laughs> to live to 115. Um, 2080, that's today's kindergarten class. And so what will the world be like I don't know that any of us can predict. What we probably can be very well assured of, it's going to continue to be a technology advanced society. You look at just in the, in the time of the last couple decades and from the introduction to the personal computer to now, you go into uh, many of our elementary schools, in fact, probably if I ask our students here, they're probably all carrying a cell phone with a uh, camera, iPod, everything uh, on it there that is more high tech than anything that I encountered graduating until I graduated from college. It's that much advancement just in the last 30 years. And so we know that technology integration is something that we need to continue to work toward to improve upon. One of the things that was a real success last year was our ability uh, to work with the city of Dublin and in their visions for the Bridge Street uh, corridor, that allowed us a dedicated funding stream for technology. And so that has really helped us in moving forward and we look forward to that ability going forward. Also looking forward to uh, Dana McDaniel and his new leadership in the FiberLink that is being uh, already embedded in Dana's work in, in bringing state dollars to Dublin and, and our goal to tap into that. Tapping in our students into high-speed networks connecting with every college uh, uh, in the state of Ohio through ORNET. So Dana, thank you for your leadership with that. Technology integration going forward is huge. It is huge, and so our next video is going to show, again, how we're making forward, forward positive steps on the integration of technology in Dublin classrooms. Hi, my name is Katie O'Neill. I teach math at Carr Middle School to seventh graders. Chromebooks in the classroom, total and complete game changer. Um, the possibilities are now endless. My lesson plans have completely transformed. Differentiation has taken on a whole new meaning. I can put kids in small groups. They can work individually. I can work one-on-one -on -one with students. Our whole Google program takes it to an even higher level. I can't wait to do cross-district collaboration with my friends and the other middle school buildings. As far as the digits program is concerned, the kids can work at their own pace now. I know a lot of teachers across the district are doing a flipped classroom and are having tremendous success with that. It's also wonderful for our special needs students because they are able to get modifications at home, in school, during study center. The Chromebooks have just opened up an entire world of possibilities. This is just one way how technology in the classroom is helping to create the Dublin difference.
And again, we are going to put full effort in further integration of technology in the classroom because not just for those kindergartners, but for our high school students, we know that going out into the world of work, that is a technological world. And for us to ensure that we instill our students with every tool that they need in their toolbox to be successful, we need to continue to make efforts to move forward with technology integration into the classroom. So I've been sharing the great things about our students, about our parents, about our teachers. Wonderful story here in Dublin, and I thank you for coming out here tonight. I'd be remiss, and I have to also take this opportunity to share a couple challenges. And Steve has done a great job of sharing challenges, and I'm, I'm also remiss, I should congratulate Steve and his office just received a clean audit and a treasurer's reward from the state of Ohio. How many years in a row was that for you, Steve? 15 years in a row of a clean audit, so congratulations. Very quickly, I want to run through some challenges. This 559 days has allowed me to look and come into a district with fresh eyes, and as many things that I see that are wonderful in this district, I do see some challenges on the horizon, and I see some choppy waters as we go forward as a school district in order to not just maintain our high standard of excellence, but improve upon our accomplishments of our students and improve upon our preparation of all students with a world-class, well-rounded education. We are, and I see, and let me back up one second. When I say the word challenge, I want you to also replace that in your mind with the word opportunity. Because I think every challenge is truly an opportunity and, and for us to continue this conversation, I want to have you thinking about that. Our first challenge is we are becoming very much a highly diverse school district. I've talked about the economic diversities here, but I want to talk about the geographic change that is happening to our students here in Dublin City Schools. When Flo was in Dublin schools a long time ago, it was probably a pretty uh, homogeneous group. And even you look at Dublin and the yearbooks going back 15, 20 years, diversity was not something that you equated with Dublin City Schools. And I'll share with you, it is today, and that's wonderful. Because our students that are seated before me here are going out into a global world. And many of you already are working in that global world where a business trip doesn't mean going to Cleveland, it means going to China. And that is the future. And so our students today in Dublin are able to not only interact and, and be educated side by side, but learn the culture of children and students from all across the globe. I'm going to read something to you, and, and I couldn't memorize this because the list is long, but the number of countries, the list I'm going to read to you is the number of countries since August 1st of this school year that children have enrolled in Dublin City Schools after leaving this country, these, these countries. Now, I want you first off to get a get a guess in your mind, how many different countries since August 1st of this year do you think that children have come here from? 10? 30? 45? 45 different countries have given us the privilege of having children come to Dublin schools, and I'm going to read off these countries and I'm going to read the student counts. And again, as I do this, this is since August 1st of this school year. We've enrolled two children from Afghanistan, two from Algeria, 12 from Bangladesh, four from Canada, 13 from China, one from Colombia, two from the Dominican Republic, eight from Egypt, one from El Salvador, two from Ethiopia, three from Germany, two from Guatemala, 139 from India, one from Indonesia, 41 from Iraq, five from Iran, one from Italy, 81 from Japan, eight from Jordan, one from Kenya, 25 from Korea, three from Kuwait, now you see why I had to use the paper, two from Kyrgyzstan, two from Lebanon, 
one from Libya, three from Malaysia, 26 from Mexico, one from Nepal, one from Nigeria, one from Oman, six from Pakistan, two from Palestine, one from Peru, three from Russia, 16 from Saudi Arabia, one from Singapore, one from Slovenia, six from Somalia, two from Sri Lanka, four from the Sudan, four from Syria, four from Turkey, four from the United Kingdom, Great Britain, one from Uzbekistan, and one student from Vietnam. That is amazing to me, and it is such a blessing. When I say challenge, I really want you to think of opportunity, because again, as we work to make sure that our students here in Dublin are prepared for a global world, they're living in a global world right here within the walls of Dublin City Schools. And that is so exciting to me. And that brings some challenges because several of those children come to us and they don't speak English. Nor do their parents speak any English. And trying to, trying to have that parent connection that we previously spoke of with parents who don't speak English is a challenge. And again, research shows that strong parent-school connection is vital for a great education. And so we have uh, become a very diverse school district. Again, not something in the past you may have equated with Dublin schools. We have over 1,500 children that have the label ELL, which means they come to us as English language learners. That number puts us number three in the state of Ohio. 1,500 children have come to us English is not their primary language. Most school districts in the state of Ohio are not even that size. We're over 15,000. We have 1,500 that English is not their primary language. <clears throat> We're doing a wonderful job with these children, and there are success stories that I could talk about for the next hour as far as children who have come here, learned English, gone to college, and really changed the trajectory of their family's life. They come here to a new country hoping like our ancestors did for the opportunity for success and that foundation is started here from Dublin schools so our next video is going to show the wonderful program around student diversity that is happening here in Dublin Hi, I'm Stella Villalva. I'm the elementary ELL lead teacher for the district. In my job, I get to work with both the best of both worlds. I get to teach the children at Chapman Elementary as their ELL teacher, but I also get to be the coach for our ELL staff and also for the elementary school teachers as a way to work and support English language learners. We're so blessed and so lucky in Dublin City Schools to have students that come from all over the world. In this way, we're exposing our students to language, culture, um, different mindsets, a way that we're both learning together every day. The student diversity is what makes part of the Dublin difference. And I know Stella is here and I want to thank you for her leadership of our ELL program. Again, it is a wonderful challenge and a wonderful opportunity to be able to integrate into our school children from all over the globe. Our second challenge, and, and Steve talked very uh, clearly about this, is gonna be the economic challenges that we're facing. The programs that we have in place and the excellence we have in place requires the financial commitment. And this community has always been very, very generous with the fruits of rewards for the school financially supporting these wonderful programs that you've seen and heard about tonight. Steve talked about the state funding cuts and, and, and that causes me great concern because as the, the previous slide that, that Steve had up, a large number, almost 90% of our budget is people. We are a service organization and so our, our business model is like all of those, when you run short on funds, it hits people right away. And people are programs, and that's what makes a difference for children. And when we talk about a world-class, well-rounded education, that requires numerous programs, that requires people, that requires a financial commitment. I think Steve said a $4.2 million reduction is what is currently planned in the governor's budget. Um, 
This afternoon, and this is tomorrow's dispatch article, uh, talking about Governor Kasich defending his school funding plan. And, and let me be the first to say, I think he, Governor Kasich, has a tremendously difficult job to do. And, and I don't want any comment of mine to be conceived as criticism. Um, but this is a quote. We need superintendents who are educators and fewer who are politicians. Kasich was saying in regard to those who are criticizing the state funding plan. You know, it's Steve shared, the funding is going down for Dublin. It is hard to fathom that the dollar amount that we receive per student in Dublin City Schools, which is about $1,013 ballpark uh, per student, that the private schools in this state receive more funding per pupil than we do as a public school in Dublin City Schools. When you take their administrative costs and their auxiliary costs together, private schools are funded at a higher level per pupil than Dublin City Schools. And in the proposal that has been given out, they are being awarded a 6% and a 5% increase in their budget. And I go back, Thomas Jefferson and public schools creating an educated citizenry so important for this democracy, this great country that we live in, but funding going forward is a problem. And, and if I'm gonna be criticized for being a politician, and I'm not sure for our elected officials how you feel about superintendents being called politicians. I don't know, that must be a nasty word or something uh, to be uh, called a politician. But I'm sorry, if I'm gonna be a politician or called a politician for advocating for the financial resources to operate the programs for our children and our ELL population and our athletic programs and our drama programs and all the things that make Dublin special, you can call me anything you want because my voice will not be silenced when I'm advocating for our children. And then the last challenge I just want to bring out, and, and again, we're doing wonderful work in Dublin City Schools. I want to quote a business author, Jim Collins, when he uses the phrase, good is the enemy of great. And, and we're more than a good school. We are a really, 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 really good school district here. And I think that is just an even larger barrier toward the greatness that we could achieve here in Dublin. And Public schools, if they're one thing, are very tradition-based. If you look at our system today, it's going to look very similar to, again, the system of high school or middle school or elementary that Flo attended many years ago. The agrarian calendar. I'm not sure how many of you guys need to get out so you can harvest the crops in, uh, in the spring or in the fall and plant the crops in the spring. But this agrarian calendar in 180 days and starting at school at eight and out by three, things that have been so traditional, I think are acting as a barrier for public schools. And we're going to have to start to have honest conversations about what it looks like in a new school system in a vastly changing world if we're going to provide our students the world-class, well-rounded education that they need I don't see how that can occur in the system that we've been using since Flo was an elementary school student. That's going to be a tough conversation for public education. Change is always difficult for everyone, but as Colin said, good is the enemy of great. And, and I think the one thing that all of us have in agreement here, we want great education for our children. That's why people move to Dublin for the wonderful community of which it is, in part a great school system. It's a wonderful place to raise children. And again, having that ability to have an honest and true conversation about what is it going to look like going forward as we integrate technology, as we bring in children from 45 other countries, as we look to personalize the education for our kindergarten students that won't be able to retire until 2080. That's gonna be some hard conversations and we have to work collaboratively together we have to trust one another, and we have to show appreciation to all viewpoints. We have to have the conversation, though, going forward. How are we going to best serve our children in this rapidly changing world? 
in a system that is very traditional based. So that is, that's the third and final challenge that I want to bring tonight. I've been speaking a long time and I want to thank you, not just for coming here tonight, but being a great audience and listening intently and, and moreover for just how much you value Dublin City Schools and how much you value public education in this country. I want to end with a couple thank yous. I want to sh thank Shared Visions for the wonderful production of our videos tonight. Great job on that. I want to thank Doug Baker and Julie Rauer. They designed and put all of this together and they're going to hide over the corner and not take any acknowledgement, but they've done a wonderful job in this. I want to thank Deb Papish and, Tim T and Kim Tucker, the wonderful refreshments that they were able to provide, uh, the nourishment and allowing us to come together and break bread before this. I want to thank the members of our Board of Education. You have given me an unbelievable opportunity to be a superintendent in what I feel is the best school district, hands down, in the state of Ohio. I know we're the highest achieving large, or highest achieving large school district and all of that, but the students that I am having the ability to work with every day, it's just such a true blessing for me. And probably moreover, not just being a superintendent, but my wife and I have four children, once in college, but three, because of this opportunity for me professionally, are part of this school system. It is a difference in their lives. It is a difference in all of our children's lives to be part of this wonderful school system. It is wonderful that we have a community that supports education. I want to thank all of you again for coming out tonight. And again, thank you for your support for the 15,200 plus children that attend Dublin City Schools. Thank you very much.